everybody. Um, we're uh, hoping that you're uh, going to have a bit of fun tonight as well as learn a lot. Goodness knows we could use a little more fun in our lives these days. And uh, so first of all, who are we? Um, my name is Sonia Mason. I work for the New York, New Jersey 12 conference as a program coordinator and my colleague Tori. Hello everybody. I'm Tori Finn. I am in the conservation corps manager. So I also have uh, the lucky job that I get to work for the trail conference uh, and I just, I work with the AmeriCorps members. Super. And I'm super excited about the presentation today. It's going to be great. Great. Yeah, we, we, we've been both looking forward to this for days. Um, so just so you know, we're going to go over a little bit of the protocol. We're going to keep everybody on mute to avoid that echo chamber when everybody accidentally speaks at once. Um, so if you could just post your questions, comments and thoughts on um, the chat page. Um, just bearing in mind, go ahead. And just a note on that, we're going to be having a Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, um, I'd prefer if we'd prefer if you'd be able to save them to the end. It just, um, it, it's ease for the presentation. But if you have a dying question that you just you can, you need to know right now, just um, put it in the, the chat box. And I'm going to be monitoring the chat box so I can see. And then during the Q&A session, how it's going to work is you just, you raise your hand, you do the, the hand raise, and I will call on people and I will unmute. So um, not everybody has to call at once and then you get all stressed. You're like, when do I answer my question, get my question answered? So we're just going to do it that way. Right. And um, yeah, and we're going to ask you just to keep the comments respectful for everybody, of course, and as brief as you can. Um, time. We have an hour and we're going to try and keep within it because after an hour, Tori's going to turn into a pumpkin and vanish. So we want to, we want to be with her while she's here as much as possible. So that's it. Are you ready to launch? <laughs> so Tori, graffiti. So Sonia, why can't we just leave it there? Won't it just keep coming back? What's the big deal? No, that's a very good point. And I bet you a lot of people think about that. What's the, what's the point? Why should we bother? We're just creating a blank canvas for the miscreants again, right? And we'll have to keep coming back over and over and over. And um, there are a few reasons, right? What can we think of? The first one would be, as soon as I can get it to go, it is a growing problem. We've noticed as there are more people, more new people out on the trails these days, um, there are, there's more graffiti coming up in places we never expected. So that's one. And um, yeah, where there's graffiti, there's more graffiti. By the way, um, in case you didn't know, graffiti is plural. So um, in case you thought there was a little spelling error there, uh, a single graffiti is actually a graffito. Um, and um, yeah, just like visual litter tends to kind of devalue a place. Um, people may not care as much about um, keeping it pristine if it really looks degraded. And just an another note on that, if we see what's really nice about um, nature and going out on hikes, which I'm sure all of our participants love hiking and all of that, is it's finally a time where you're not constantly inundated with images where we're, always, we're on our phones all the time, we're on our computers all the time, and we're just always surrounded by man-made images. And when you're going on a hike and you see the graffiti, it kind of, it takes that experience away from you, that chance, that very few chance that we get to completely deplug from the constant man-made imagery. So when you see this, it kind of ruins that experience. Me too, right. And, uh, and on, the, on the other, um line there, if, if, would we expect you to take care of a place as, as bejeweled as this with paint? Um, we fear that it may take the heart out of most people. And it, it is a big job and that place looks really well trammeled and, and known. So we would probably urge you to work with your land manager, whoever owns or manages that land and maybe even the town um, to see what can be done, if, if anything. Um, and then lastly, why should you help? Um, well, um, we, we do know that the, the environment tends to get short shrift when budget, budget cutting and shift, shifting is carrying on. And our, while our park managers do a fantastic job of managing with the resources they have, there's just 
they just cannot keep with growing demand. It's, it's just becoming an impossible job. And that's where volunteers can help. And we know that, um, you know, parks and, and, and everybody else is really um, eager to get rid of any um, hate stirring messages like racist or anti-Semitic. Um, it's better to get them out of the public eye before it becomes a thing. Um, so yeah, our volunteers are very um, valuable in doing that. And we hope that you will become one of those as well, or feel a little more encouraged to give it a try when we're at the end of this um, webinar. So there are a, there are a few path methods and um, the two main are either removing any tiling or painting over, which is better. So what, what do you think? Do we have anybody um, thinking that a, a yes or a no? Or a yeah, do we have any guesses? People can, you can unmute yourself or you can just guess. Mm -hmm. This is Jane Daniels. Um, I, I think it depends upon the situation. Um, whether you remove it, if you're able to get in with some of the um, removal, or that you end up painting over it. Um, the painting over takes a little bit more um, uh, skill because uh, you don't want it to show that you have painted over it. You have an experienced person there. Thanks, Jane. Hey, that was cheating. You're too experienced to answer. <laughs> you know the exact answer. I, for one, immediately went to um, remove. I was like, oh, you just need to remove it. And when uh, Sonia and I were talking about this presentation, she really opened my eyes into the, the two options that you really have. So shall we go over a few of the pros and cons of removing and painting over then? Let's do it. Okay. So if you either remove or cover. So the benefit of using chemical solvents is that there's no paint left in the environment. So nature is back to nature. However, we all know that they can be toxic. And that's something that your land manager would want to be consulted with um, because, you know, there may be sensitive species in the, in the vicinity too. And it can be messy, heavy, and you probably need a lot of water to clean it off as well. And you've got to carry that all uphill, maybe a few miles. And park management, as I mentioned, may not be excited about toxicants in the environment. And it also can leave a ghost image of your um, silhouette. You know, the rock looks suddenly clean and scrubbed instead of covered with little patinas. And the problem with paint, well, it's more paint, right? <laughs> um, it does, as Jane alluded to, require more skills and, and some techniques. But, you know, if you can get it just right, as we hope you will pick up a few tips today, um, you can make it virtually invisible. So shall we dive in as to how it's done? So just a last word on solvents. There's a picture of Ryan Seltzer of the Appalachian Trail demonstrating like a pro how to use, yes, elephant snot to remove some prom graffiti. And you can see it in that bucket there, that, that bluey goo, which is um, being administered with a high-tech implement like a straw broom painted onto the graffiti and left to bubble and then he sprays it off. But can you see in the left, the bottom right hand picture as he's spraying it off with the hot nozzle there, you can see a dark outline, a sort of a inverted V of the, um, the, gra the graffito there. So once you've cleaned off a rock, you've left a little clean impression. And there's always a risk that somebody may, may be delighted and see, oh, there was something there. We need to fill it with Beautiful <laughs> um, and um, so as far as painting goes, um, there's, a, there's an assortment of tools that you can use. Um, you probably have a few of those in your basement and maybe even some in boxes ready to be donated to Google at the end of this period now that everybody's got squeaky clean uh, basements and houses and garages that you could use. Um, Tori, would you like to name a few of those and, and, and some, some of, the, of your own inventions? I would absolutely love to. I, along with many other people, I'm sure, have been uh, cleaning out the scary closet in my apartment, the one that I don't usually like to go into. And I have found items such as, would this work 
It is a be once beautiful towel that can never seem to get clean anymore. <laughs> uh, and what about, Sonia, what about this guy? He's a sock that I once loved that um, has no buddy. Would this work? What would you use it for? Or how would you use it? You know, I'm thinking I would use it as paint. Paint on a rock. Paint applicator, okay. Oh, right. Do you remember the, the 90s stenciling craze? I don't know if there's anybody here who, who hasn't tried their hand at it. Well, remember how we did rag rolling on the, on the walls to create that natural random effect? I do remember rag rolling, unfortunately. Oh, I do remember that look. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's just the thing to use. Um, um, a great randomizing tool. And others are, you know, like that uh, orange um, old kitchen um, sponge there, uh, pads, uh, old um, brushes that you want to use up. Uh, in fact, even wire brushes, and we'll come to that. And um, basically a mixed assortment of spray paints or, or other paints. Um, and um, don't forget, um, you want a good cleanup crew uh, as well. You're going to be full. You're going to have a lot of sticky things um, to take down from the mountain, and it's so much better putting it in a plastic bag than in your backpack. Um, no trace. Yeah. Even though we'll be leaving a trace, <laughs> leave as little trace as possible. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. And you want to be able to clean up. A YP is nice because it's got a bit of soap um, and water as well. Um, of course, gloves. And um, if you're going to be using spray paint, well, nobody no doesn't know what a mask is anymore. So bring one of those too. And you know those t-shirts that are full of holes and that you're too embarrassed to give away to the thrift store? Well, you know, they can have their second renaissance as a cleanup crew as well. I'm sure they'll be proud to to have another go at life before they're disposed of. So what types of paint would you use? Um, can you tell why those ones with the X are no good? Um, so nothing shiny, preferably, uh, or something that's going to probably wash away in weathering pretty soon. Um, Rust-Oleum have come out with a great camouflage set, which are kind of very imitative of um, natural um, colors and they're very flat as well. And so, so flat and matte is what you want. You know, you don't want shiny enamel or anything like that. You don't want to bring, draw attention to your work of art, even if you've done a great job. So colors. So take a look at those graffiti on the, the big graffiti on the right. Um, if you had to cover up the images on the right hand side, you'd use a quite a different set of paints, the ones on the left hand side, right? And, um, and also look, look at the RIP one. Um, how many colors can you notice just in the, uh, that you would need for that one alone? Just one? How many do you think you see, Tori? I see many. I see a uh, gray, black, green even. Oh, wow. Yeah, got a little green in there. Great. So yeah, take a snapshot of it as well so that you can, you know, remember what they were. And then when you really um, take a close up look as like the image on the left, even that rock though, it looks like it's mostly gray. You know, if, you're, if there was graffiti smooshed over that, you would need what at least how many colors? Anybody want to type up a guess? One color, two color, three color, four? I'm, I'm tempted to rhyme. <laughs> we'll just say many colors. Right. All right. Devin says four, maybe. Yeah, all right, Devin. <laughs> right. Fine, four. So there's helpful little things like those little quartzite rocks and those splotches of lichen also help to create a varied landscape, which means you need more paints, but it's to your advantage and we will show you how. Um, one more thing before we go on to that. Um, Take a photo of your rock face on a Goldilocks day. What, what is a Goldilocks day, <laughs> Tori, and why? <laughs> well, today is definitely not a Goldilocks day. Today was a beautiful, bright, super bright day. Um, I hear it's supposed to rain tomorrow, so tomorrow wouldn't work either. You want that nice in-between day. That day where the lighting is just muted enough that it's kind of the average. Ah, okay. So that you don't have an overexposed photo or, an un or two dark colors in the end. 
Um, and also get two to three contrasting colors. Don't try to get gray and then slightly darker gray and slightly lighter gray. Um, study your rock face and see the contrast and get as those, those three contrasts if you can. Um, and then there are nifty names like seal skin and olive gray that work for most rocks. But again, yours may be different. Um, yours may be a warm sandstony color. Um, so pop quiz, um, show of hands. Um, if you would, well, show of hands. Um, should we do a show of hands or have everybody type in the answer? Everybody, uh, full disclosure, everybody, we had a poll going for this, but unfortunately we're having te technical Zoom difficulties, so we can't do a poll, sadly. But we'll do the poll in the chat. So everybody type uh, which, which one you think is the answer, and we'll kind of do a guess in a minute. This is just to make sure you're still with us. <laughs> all right, all right, good. All right, yes. We got everybody is paying attention. I love it. I love it. Tuesday night class. Everybody's everybody's good. Everybody's good. Yeah, we have a switched on class. I, we knew that already. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Whatever in the basement can apply if it's a flat outdoor paint, of course. Um, that was the trick question. Well, thank you, everybody. Okay, so before we go into tips and techniques. Um, I want to uh, introduce you to a concept of how to see things. You know, if anybody's done Art 101 class, the teacher, first of all, tries to break down your way of seeing things. We see things in designer kind of imagery, the way they're supposed to be images. We don't really look, and we certainly don't look at messiness. You know, nat nature is, is naturally messy. It's, it's busy. It's got a whole lot of things going on it. For example, um, even just a patch of grass, or if you look out into the trees, you see the storm of twigs and sticks. Um, you don't see nice clear surfaces that we humans make and surround ourselves with. Um, so for example, a lawn is a great human made artifact. A lawn, you can see that stick there very clearly, okay? Um, because it's not in the brush. When you throw it in the, in the brush, it suddenly becomes invisible. So this is a concept we, we really want to impress upon you and um, have you remember. So because your eye is deflected by scrubbiness, we tend not to look at them. <coughs> your graffiti cover-up job is, is mimicking that scrubbiness. You will have done a fantastic job because nobody's gonna notice or look. And say, That's why I love this activity because it lets you be a little silly about it. It's, it doesn't yeah. have to be perfect. It's just like, you know, Love to love a good basic um, craft project. So the, the messier, the better. And that's what I love. Exactly. So graffiti cover up is not fine art. We don't expect you to spend, you know, 10 days in a row trying to get it right. Um, that would just um, uh, kill anybody. Uh, this is about using clever techniques and observation of your environment to do as good a, a masking effect as possible or mimicking the environment. So again, even on rocks that look very plain, like the one in the right image. It looks like it's just one tan color, right? But do you see those little cracks there, those little curvy things? They have a darker color to them. And I see some tan, I see a little bit of orangey, I see a little bit of gray, I see a little bit darker green gray. So it's already got some, some mixtures going for it. And those you would use to your advantage to hide the graffiti. Um, in the, in the left-hand um, image, for example, that's a close-up of a different rock. How many colors can you see in there? Do you guys want to type in any and Tori can pull them out? Is everybody seeing Sonia's as full screen? And Everybody uh, raise your uh, thumbs up or thumbs down that I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Walter, I'm not sure how you guys aren't seeing her full screen. Might be a view setting that you need to do. Um, okay. So we have at least four or five colors. So we have a, a, bunch of, a bunch of colors, I think, is the good takeaway. Super. Yeah, that's about right, the range as well. Well done, guys. You're getting your eye in. And you see that word mottling? That's going to be a word that you will take away with you from this webinar, if nothing else. So look at these really wild 
rock surfaces compared to the bland ones before. These are stark contrasts. There's like very light, almost white um, lichen on almost a gunmetal gray surface. And then, and then what about the right hand one? It's got some oranges and pinks thrown in and green grays. It's, um, and you know, that is a beautiful surface to paint on if you want to disguise graffiti because you have a lot of things going to your advantage there. Tori, you're looking uh, perturbed. Is there? Oh, no. no. <laughs> I'm answering a question. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. In case somebody sees thing. something. All right. And I'm happy to go back. Also notice how the indents in rock are darker and the crests are lighter. That's another little uh, weapon in your arsenal to remember. And lichen is always your friend. So one of the things somebody asked me was, should we prime really bright, stark, heavy, um, obvious graffiti? And that's up to you. Um, you don't have to, but if you're worried that um, it may, you know, if your covering may weather and this stuff will protrude, or if it's really bright and shiny and strong, um, you can do that. Um, I would recommend you also use a mottling kind of, um, um, you know, a blotchy kind of covering like, like it was done here. And you can also wire brush away some of the graffiti if it's very thick and shiny and almost leathery skin. It'll help your paint to adhere at least and uh, remove the shine. Okay, so now we're going into the, the main course of how to graffiti, um, how to cover graffiti rather. Your own nat nature's looking graffiti, we'll say. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Imitating nature. So again, here we have a very simple kitchen sponge. Um, I don't think you get like three to a dollar at the dollar store. Um, they don't last very long, so they're ideal for this. Um, right here. Has, has, anybody, has anybody who's ever stenciled has learned, always put on just a little bit. If you put a lot on, you're going to have a, a lot of paint to, to fix, um, probably. Um, but again, just um, if you see in the bottom image, just brushing that very lightly on the surface, touch the highlights of the rocks and it created a gray, a dark and a light contrast on there. It's creating some of that visual noise already that's natural to a rock. On the image at the top, um, if you paint it in little kind of um, rosettes uh, on, the, on, the, on the sponge, you'll get almost perfect uh, lichen lookalikes. Gosh, that sounds like an alliteration. Say that six times fast. <laughs> um, so, um, more tips and techniques, mottling again. Um, so, so the idea is intentional randomness. So it looks random, but you're not just going all over the place. So it kind of looks weird, but you, 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 you're actually driving how it's going to be random. Um, the rock at the top it doesn't look very real, I think, to most people, partly because the, the original red of the, the, the paint behind it is showing. Um, but um, these are experimental rocks that, rocks that I tried on for, you know, if it doesn't come out all that perfect, um, or if I try something that looked really weird, what's it going to look like? And honestly, I didn't, I, I almost stumbled over the rocks. I didn't see them uh, until I saw the red. So they will blend into the, um, the background by virtue of being natural colors and by virtue of being a mottled effect. Um, so don't worry about perfection. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. I'm just that it's, as you can see, like that, even though it's covering something red, it, you can't really see the red part, like that it's covered. So it's, if you're, it's, while it might not necessarily look like the most natural looking rock, it's clearly better than the red that there. Right. And one way of testing your success is to um, enlist the help of a passerby and ask them if they can see the graffiti. But don't look at the graffiti, look anywhere but, but and let them pass about looking for graffiti. And if they can't see your cover-up job, you can pack your tools and go home. You've done, you're done. You've uh, done a great job. So another technique, um, the lichen blotches. He has a big paint pad. You don't have to cover the entire paint pad. Again, just randomly, you know, cover it with a little bits of paint, um, and you can do great high. This is this rock is just lovely with high contrast. This is where I'm saying be bold and use high contrast to your advantage because nature does it. And if you're looking like nature, 
um, your job is half made. What if you make an oopsie? I don't know what you're talking about. I never make an oopsie. My craft <laughs> projects are always perfect. Well, you're a, you're a fine art student. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what would you do if you made an oopsie in this case, Tori? Well, I think I would use this handy toothbrush. I keep all of my toothbrushes <laughs> for craft projects for this specifically. It would be great. Um, I think I would just try to blend the paint in with this right. fun uh, toothbrush. Yeah, there's, there's a really great way to use those toothbrushes that just kept getting thrown away and ending up in whale's bellies and giving us all grief. Um, at least it can get another function here. Um, a wire brush works as well. And, and you're going to be now being brave and you're going to paint unpainted rock. You're going to gently brush fingers and slivers and feathers of your paint out onto virgin rock. So yeah, you're going to be cringing when you do this. But you want the transition between your, the edge of your graffiti to be a transition zone. You don't want it to be a hard edge because that will show people, oh, there was something here. Um, something's missing. And, um, and the, the picture on the right shows the, is, is where that uh, oopsie line was drawn and it's gone and been brushed into rock, which is a different color too. It's, um, it's a warm rock, but we'll, we'll, we'll zoom out soon and show you the whole, the whole place again. Uh, feathering is, is another word that's um, one you'll take away with you. Uh, breaking the original outline. Um, you can also do this with spray paint. Always hold a spray paint as far as you can first, because many of us have learned uh, the lesson of holding it too close and then having a little bit of a wipe up and cover up job, taking us a little longer than we intended. But um, spray can work just as well for you. So you can also use any handy dandy items in your house, um, you know, that, um, steel wool that's kind of rusting away in the basement. Um, there's a strand of it in the top corner, um, which I've stretched out into almost like a hand-like shape so that there's holes and gaps that appear. This was a suggestion by one of my colleagues who tried it and I thought I would go and test it. And then when I, I sprayed a very contrast, high contrast colors, almost black and almost white. Um, and then when I took the, the, uh, steel wool away, I went, oh my gosh, it looks terrible. It looks like zebras. So I hastily blotted it and then I rubbed it and then I spread some water on it and I rubbed it some more. And after a while, it, the, the paint just blended into that um, image at the bottom. So it took on a rock-like patina with intermediate grays as well because the two paints kind of mixed a little. Um, so you can fix mistakes as well. And even if they start out looking rather weird, you can make them, can naturalize them after a while. I think the big takeaway is you want anything that's going to give texture because everything in nature has a lot of texture to it. So even, even a, a flat rock may seem like it's just one flat um, surface, but it really even itself has some texture to it. So when you're looking in your, um, your house or your apartment or wherever you're living right now and you see things you're like, oh, this could add some texture. Just that's exactly what you're going to want to use. Right. Exactly. So we have another quiz and uh, we have now a little bit of music to wake us all up um, while you write down your answers. Um, and we might do a silly dance as well to entertain you if you're um, and you're very welcome to join in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Are those answers coming in? Oh, wow, look at this. Everybody's paying attention. You're doing great. Everybody gets A's, A pluses in uh, Professor Mason and Professor Finn's class. Okay. So, everybody said B. Yay, win. Are we done? We are done. <laughs> okay, and we'll carry on. A resounding, a resounding B. Fantastic. <laughs> we have a class who's just aced this. Our class okay, is the class. Somebody asked about trees. 
And yeah, when you look at that, you think, why would somebody want to do that to a tree instead of hug it? Um, and especially since they have scaly and fissured bark and it can be really hard to get paint off without scarring the tree some more, right? Um, there are ways and means of doing this. So, um, I think every volunteer at the trail conference by, know, by now knows what those tools at the bottom are, the handy dandy tree scraper. Um, it's um, managed to take off a whole lot of expiring old trailblazers so that you can put a fresh one on. And these are gonna be your friends with tree, um, tree um, graffiti. Again, you're going to apply them very lightly. You're gonna always start with a light touch. And you know, even though it takes you longer, you don't want to remove too much of the bark. And those little wire brushes can get into the fissures quite well. And then for residual paint that stubbornly stays there, um, there's Mo Lemire, our AT chair, um, spritzing the <laughs> spray. Look at that expert <laughs> action he's got with that spray. Look at that form. Yep, yep. And, he's, and it, look how far he is from the tree as well. So he's making sure that it, it just dusts the tree and that can often be enough. And here is Chris from um, New York State Parks demonstrating how to take one off in three steps. So he's using his scraper first and then the light wire brush. And then now, can you see this, pine, this lovely old pine tree has got a gray brown bark. And when you scrape it away, it becomes red brown. So it shows like something was there and what to do about that. If you don't have quite the right uh, gray browns to, to lightly paint over that or preferably spray over that if you can, um, he went and rubbed in some soil from the ground. Now I hear you asking, well, won't it rain? And you're right, it will wash off when it rains. But the soil also has a whole lot of starter material to create another patina on the tree. It's got the, the little spores of mushrooms and lichen and mosses and whatnot to cover and, and start to adhere to the recently scratched off bark. We tested this and then we had everybody walk through the trail who had been cleaning out the, the graffiti on this trail uh, walk back and try to spot them and see if they could tell where the graffiti used to be. And even on the tree, they all walked past it, even though it had that little bit of scraping on it. A lot of the times the trees themselves are scraped by woodpeckers and little critters and porcupines and whatnot as well. So um, it's not as drastic as you think. Um, and um, if you need to break out a stark straight um, outline, then you may want to scrape you know, do a bit of feathering with your scraper as well, like you would on a rock. Befores and afters. There's Tara, our supervisor for the, long, for the Appalachian Trail and a long distance uh, a hiker. Um, she just completed the Appalachian Trail a few years ago. She's removing a little piece of nature love. Um, <laughs> do you know, do you, Territory, do you think people are doing Painting hearts on rock because they want to show their love for nature, perhaps? No, people love, love nature so much that the only way they seem to be able to express it is to spray paint a heart on many things, which, you know, <laughs> may not be the best way. So our showing of love is to remove those hearts. <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe a little bit of misplaced love, I think. <laughs> They'd probably be better doing it on paper and sending it to each other. But again, if you look at the image on the right, can you tell where the heart was? Now, now I can see some of you more experienced guys going, yeah, but that doesn't look too realistic. I mean, the green doesn't really match and the white doesn't really match. You, know, you can see that's not a great job. Again, um, the, the color of the paint we had didn't quite match every single surface. And so we try to match it with what there was. There was moss on this rock, there was lichen on this rock, and we played that up. And we had people walk past, didn't even notice. Remember, walkers by are not looking for graffiti as such, or looking to inspect your graffiti. They are just looking at nature, and their eyes are, are being diverted from um, a messy, random looking surface. Um, and that's what we're trying to achieve here. Same in this one as well. The paint actually got scraped away pretty nicely, but there was a ghost image left. 
And um, again, your, your uh, net friends in nature are also blotches of sunlight on the rock. See how they make such a strong contrast on the rock. You can't actually see, if you, even if you look hard, as to where the graffiti was. So you're looking for that general effect. Um, it's good enough to, to disappear into the background. Here's a huge one with really loud colors. Um, um, I see somebody plain, painted um, a, um, a primer kind of layer over it. What would you do to kind of blend it more into the rock now? Does anybody want to share some, some ideas? Take a, a hint is look at, the, look at the striping and splotching on the natural rock around it. How would you use that to your advantage? It's a great exercise. Would you need to go to the shop 15 times to get that exact color match? I'm or thinking no. I'm thinking. Wait, did I hear somebody? I'm not sure if I heard somebody. Um, I'm thinking no. I am not. If I hiked all the way up there uh, with what I have, I am not going all the way back down and going to the store and then coming all the way back up with a different color. So... So what would you do? Would you take photos, I guess, of the, of the paint, try to match it? Yes. And then notice the, the, the striping down on the sides of the rock as with the weathering as a, as a rain dissolves chemicals and they run down the side of the rock and, and also spread a bit of moss as well. Those are your friends as well as the freckling, the light freckling at the top with lichens and whatnot. Um, that I would bring into the picture and create more of them and cross over the edges of the, the, the um, graffiti and onto the rock as well. So sort of to create, I'd probably even do like a um, diagonal sort of sprinkling of them um, to, to bring it out. Um, but it, it would take a little bit longer because that's a big, that's a big uh, rock to cover. And that said, um, hiding ghosts, here's another um, um, Everybody's oh. favorite image. People need new material, right? It's, we got love in the last one, another heart. Yep, yep. <laughs> Too much love for nature there. It's being left for nature. nature. So, so here, the, the, there's the ghost remnant of the heart once it's been scraped over. And how are you going to get rid of that ghost image? Well, look at those great freckles of lichen there. That's even got some nice, lovely orange ones and green ones and light ones. And, and then among dark blotches as well. And that's what you use to your advantage. And yeah, that doesn't look like a perfect job, but it's good enough. We had people walk across it without nary a thought in their heads. It, it works. And again, it breaks my heart when people paint over old rock tripe, which takes so long to, to grow. And what do you do? Do you brush it all off and create another image? Well, and, uh, there's somebody demonstrating a little bit of nifty painting. We scrubbed some off on the smooth parts, but we also um, applied at least two different types of color. There was gray, light gray, and then very dark to create a kind of a shadow, which actually worked really well with this. Um, the sun is also dappling this rock really strongly. Can you see that? And that also works to your advantage. Even, even paint in the dappled sun, sun contrast as well if you can because that's going to be there for a long time and lastly take photos we want to see them and admire them and show them to your park partners as well um take don't be like me and never take a before picture of any project i ever do and then get incredibly devastated um that i didn't just like uh the closet that i just cleaned out last weekend i forgot to take a before picture don't be, don't be like me definitely take before pictures because um yeah, see if you can remember. Now, if you look at the after image, you can tell sort of where the graffiti was, right? Because the colors don't quite match the rock. That rock was really hard to, to match exactly because it's this warm, sandstony, slightly auburn mixture. But look at the rock around it, how dark and splotchy it is. Now that can be moved into the place where the graffiti was, and that could work. Um, again, passerbys were asked to point out where the graffiti was and after looking around they went what do you mean the purple thing there and that's all they saw 
they didn't think there was any graffiti anywhere else. So again, now we have our master of graffiti removal here, Glenn Collins, our volunteer. Angela of the trail conference. Yep, yep. <laughs> he's, he's, he's our absolute star. Um, he goes up the Appalachian Trail on Bear Mountain almost every week with large trash bags because it's such a heavily trammeled trail. And he's become quite adept at um, removing graffiti, as you can see. However, even Glenn, Glenn isn't perfect. Can you see why? Look really hard at the bottom of the graffiti. And then in the other picture, you might see a faint ghost outline, even though he managed to match the paint almost perfectly. He's got a lot of rocks that color on his trail. Um, so can you see how the weathering washes down, that little white sort of striping? Um, if you were looking to for, for, for graffiti and you knew it was there before, you might see it. But the chances of anybody else seeing it are virtually nil. Um, and uh, Glenn also says that these me methods also work for scratchiti, um, uh, including on trees, although trees as they grow are bigger, as you know, their, their scars kind of deepen and widen. So it becomes a little harder to cover them over time. So we want to hear from you now. <laughs> Thank you so much for paying, staying with us. And oh, wow, we're way within an hour. So we've got time for <laughs> some tips to share. We, we know we have a few um, veteran graffiti coverers over there. So please throw out your, your ideas and we'll shout them out. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, comments, or anything at all, um, just use the hand raise um, and I'll call on you or, or you can use the chat box. Or maybe nobody has any questions. And we're just all super excited. We'll start uh, going. Oh, oh, we do have questions. Okay. Michael says, are there any markings you may find that you shouldn't paint over? Ooh, that's a good question. Or is it safe to assume anything out there is graffiti? Mm, that is an excellent question. Thank you. Good question. Um, take a photo, show it to your park manager because they will ascertain whether that it's existed there before, if they know that, that piece of land and whether it's a good idea to remove it and how. But always work with your, your land people, uh, your land managers. Um, the, you know, the burden of responsibility lies on their shoulders. So they really want to be involved and make sure everything's okay. They have a lot of stakeholders to keep happy. So um, definitely do that. Okay. Um, and then Dave has a kind of a similar question. If we see graffiti in a park, what is the best protocol uh, for doing these techniques? Uh, just do it. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> well, question. yeah. W once you've received permission from your park manager to go forth and do, um, definitely. Okay, Let's give a couple of minutes in case anybody else has any questions. So I think everybody can kind of see that we've almost emphasized the, the painting aspect over the chemical aspect. Um, and that's mostly for, well, that's for a couple of reasons, but a big one is just feasibility. It's just a lot easier to do it and it's a lot cheaper. Um, and if you're going on a big hike, you don't have to carry all this equipment. So we really just want the, the technique that most people are gonna be able to use. Okay, Devin has a question. Um, do you keep a list of particularly high abuse areas? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Point Mountain in Hunter and County, New Jersey is particularly bad. And how do we find the contact information of a park manager? Some excellent questions there. Unfortunately, we do not keep a list. Um, we, we tend to deal with problems as they crop up. Some of them have been around for a long time. You may notice Breakneck Ridge, uh, one of the, the first slides. Um, it's been around and it's growing and I know that's something we're gonna have to deal with. Um, how do you get hold of a, of a park manager? Um, your trail map will probably indicate the name of the park and you can just Google it and you'll get the, the phone number of the office. That's usually the fastest way and that you can get any time. Otherwise, if you're, having, um, if you're struggling, just um, contact the trail conference office. The, volunteer at NYNJTC and we'll, we'll find you the right person. Yeah, I was going to say, honestly, if you Google um, 
the specific hike, the name of the hike, and, oh. and park manager, it's it, most of the time it comes up with their contact information. Right. And if it's the wrong office, they'll, put, they'll send you to the right office. So When Linda, Linda says, um, she's been working with uh, New York City um, DEP on graffiti removal at Breakneck. Yay, Linda. Hey. Uh, Tested numerous products, definitely came out with painting. Um, ironically, survey of hikers found the visitors from the, that they did not mind graffiti from the city. You know, okay. I guess it's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, <laughs> Right, some people don't mind, but some people do. And I, I personally am on the side of in nature, you want that serene experience and graffiti is not giving that to you. So, I mean, some people may not like it, but it's not for everybody. Yeah, so we need to probably get a leave no trace kind of message out there of how to yes, know. Exactly. Right. Wow, that must've been a shocker, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, Dave, we're, we're with you on that one. Um, okay. Anybody else? Any other uh, questions or comments or anything? This is good. These were good questions, good comments. Um, okay. It kind of looks like that that may be, that may be it. Well, thank you, everybody. We, we're going to send you an email. Um, this uh, video will be uh, with, with a link to it. It has been recorded. And also we have more uh, on our digital learning page. So we'll send you a link to that as well if there are any other topics of interest. Uh, feel free to contact us as well through that email with, with more comments and thoughts, <laughs> after thoughts and questions. Yeah, it's a big learning process for us going from um, out on the trails to doing virtual. So thank you so much everybody for coming. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as clearly Sonia and I did. Yeah, we did. And we, we hope that you'll go forth and, and uh, become the next uh, secret army of um, graffiti D or neutralizers, should I say. We don't really have a team uh, as such. Um, teams are kind of formed as needed. Um, this, this group here, um, in this last slide, there, were, there was a whole trail of graffiti on the Appalachian Trail. They managed to do some really quick thinking from some of the leaders there, um, apprehend the suspects, in fact, who came to help. And we worked with them to neutralize all the graffiti as well. And, um, you know, they were just dedicated people, uh, mostly uh, associated with that trail itself. So we find, um, you know, if you, if you need help, uh, with things, um, do contact us and we'll, we'll see if we can find people who can help you out as well. Uh, just super quick, we have one last question from Lori. Um, she said, instead of using chemical methods, why not a physical removal like sandblasting? Oh. I imagine sandblasting would be very difficult though, that you'd have to carry all of that up to, that's and it would also need power, I'm assuming. No, that's a fabulous question. I was actually hoping somebody would ask it. Well, there we go. It just seemed too obvious, you know the weight of the sand, how much do you need, and what kind of machinery you need to blast it away. It's going to be heavy and strong. Um, and probably in the form of a truck or something like that, some, some um, engine's going to need to blast it out as well. You know, that, that carrier that Ryan was carrying just had water. So you can spray water without needing a lot of um, heavy machinery and so forth. But with sand, um, probably stuff that's on the roadside. You'd also need probably some money to pay for the petrol and the driver and the equipment and all of that as well. So again, it depends on how expensive um, you can get, how much um, um, capacity you have for that. And also the willingness of the land manager. Is, is that something they feel appropriate? Again, sand also creates a wonderful ghost image as well, in a really clean rock. So either you're gonna do the entire surface so that there's nothing, um, um, contrasting with it or you're going to have to do a little bit of painting to to blend it in again that's an excellent question guys okay Alrighty. no more <laughs> right i think that's it well everybody have a wonderful night um it was lovely seeing um and uh hearing from you all great yeah we'll go out with a little bit of music and wish you have a good evening <laughs> thank you for joining us Good Thank night. You.
Alasta music. Here we go. <laughs> Go get some exercise. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop the recording and then, um, there we go.